Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alexandra Daki, and I am a committee member of Oxford Economic Society. Uh, all of our events for this term are online, and all of them will be streamed on our Facebook page and then po posted in a, uh, on our YouTube channel afterward. Last week, we had Dr. Van Graven, who was talking about decolonizing economics, and you can find the recording of her lecture on our YouTube. Our next event will be tomorrow, and we will have Niels Rohovic talking about economic pluralism. Uh, so check out, check out our event on Facebook if you are interested in that. Uh, th this week, we are very happy to host Professor Randall Wright, who, who is a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and, and senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute of Bard College in New York. He is a prominent proponent of modern monetary theory in macroeconomics, which challenges the conventional views on monetary and fiscal policy. Randall Wright has published widely in edited books and academic journals, including Journal of Economic Issues, the Cambridge Journal of Economics, and the Journal of post keynesian Economics. The talk will be dedicated to the modern monetary policy responses to the ongoing pandemic from the perspective of the modern monetary theory. Um, the format of our meeting today will be 45 minute talk and then the 15 minutes of questions from the audience. Uh, we have posted a link on, uh, in the description of our Facebook event uh, on, on like our Facebook. So uh, if, if, you, if you want a question, uh, if you have a question that you would like to be asked, <coughs> Professor, you can, uh, you should go to this link and then give us our question. I will, uh, and I will, I, I will read that after the um, talk. Um, so, okay, uh, thank you for, uh, for, for joining us, uh, Professor Wright. We are very happy to have you here today. And if you're ready, we can start with the presentation. Okay, thanks for the invitation. Let me share the screen. Oops, I'm not able to. <laughs> and while we're doing that, let me just make one correction. I retired from UMKC. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I no longer teach there. I teach at Bard uh, and at the Levy. So uh, let me do you see. think you, you could try now? Let me try. Yep, now I can. Okay, sorry about that. And do this. Okay. So. Um, let me begin. We um, face a multitude of pandemics. So now we have COVID-19. Um, there's a pretty good possibility that we're going to have different versions of this disease uh, hitting us maybe every couple of years. We also have the pandemic of a climate catastrophe. In the United States, at least, uh, we have pandemics of racism, of the forever wars, the forever fires. Right now, I am in uh, in the West, in Oregon, and the fire season now in California is a whole year. Um, we have pandemics of inequality, of access to healthcare, education, housing, wealth, and jobs. We have pandemics of poverty, unemployment, homelessness, financialization, secular stagnation, refugees, rising sea levels, and we could go on and on. So multiple pandemics. When um, the COVID crisis hit, um, many people uh, started talking about MMT. And it was in the headlines all over the world. Every important central banker uh, financial uh, markets uh, person, uh, heads of the finance ministry or treasury all had to weigh in uh, and say that uh, we found this new way to finance the COVID response. Uh, we're going to use central banks to drop helicopter money into the economy. Uh, this is MMT. And uh, Japan has been doing MMT for a while, and now we're all going to adopt it. <clears throat> but we have to be very careful. MMT is only for a crisis. We would only use it in a crisis, okay? It's very dangerous because it's 
it is potentially inflationary and could drive us to Zimbabwe land with hyperinflation. Okay, but our response is, first, we're in the age of multiple permanent pandemics. The crises are not going to end. <laughs> there is no end in sight. Second, MMT says there's only one, one way that modern governments spend. Uh, there, this is not something you apply only in a crisis. Uh, MMT accurately describes the way governments actually spend, which is that central banks credit bank reserves and banks credit the deposits of the recipients. That is a description. It's not a policy uh, recommendation. It's not a policy you use in crisis. This is the way modern governments spend. Okay, so MMT is largely a description or better, we could say it is a framework for analyzing sovereign currency nations, nations where governments issue their own currency, how that works. Now, it's very different from the orthodox view. Uh, the orthodox view is that in normal times, you tax and then you spend the revenue. Limited borrowing could be okay, especially in a recession. So a deficit is okay, and you uh, finance that by borrowing. You have to worry about the sustainability condition. And the, uh, the main one is that uh, you need the growth rate above the interest rate, or the problem is that debt service will grow relative to the size of the economy. And so government spending on interest will grow and potentially grow without limit because <clears throat> the government will need to finance its spending on interest by more borrowing. Increasing government spending though, tends to slow the growth rate because government is not as efficient as the private sector and it pushes up the interest rate. This is the crowding out theory. So all the government borrowing will push up the interest rate and we're gonna have slower growth. So we're going to end up with growth below the interest rate. Furthermore, the debt burdens are grandkids. I guess a lot of you are grandkids. Uh, you're all gonna to have to pay this back. And uh, you know, all the old generation is leaving you with all of this debt that you're going to have to pay back. And the result will be slow growth, heavy indebtedness, taxing you a lot, we're gonna end up with secular stagnation. On the other hand, government might print money to pay for its spending, but that causes inflation, and then we're off to Zimbabwe. So you have to avoid that. Well, Paul Samuelson, who wrote the textbook uh, your grandparents all used, he was I was going to say the Mankiw of his day, but he was much greater than Mankiw. Um, in any case, he gave an interview in 1974 with, with Blaug, Mark Blaug. You can find it online. I urge you to uh, Google it, uh, the Samuelson interview by Mark Blaug, because it's very interesting. I have a long quote in the blue. I'm not going to read that. You can read that later. But basically what he's saying is, can you keep a secret the necessity of balancing the budget, whether we're talking about uh, annually or over the business cycle, is that old time religion we use to scare politicians and the population to behave themselves. It's like the grim fairy tales that we tell our children, uh, you know, the wolves in the forest kind of a story so that they won't wander around in the forest. We have to scare the politicians all sorts of bad things will happen if they run budget deficits. Okay, It's not true, but keep the secret. Don't let it out. Don't let the cat out of the bag. Um, more recently, Ben Bernanke, who was the chair of the Fed during the global financial crisis, uh, the Fed spent and lent a total of $29 trillion to bail out the global financial system uh, in the aftermath of the GFC. And so Congress called him in because they were very worried. He said, 
look what the Fed is doing with taxpayer money. And so they asked him, uh, are you spending taxpayer money to bail out the financial system? And he said, no, 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 it's not tax money. We simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account. It's just keystrokes. We're not spending tax money. We keystroke credits to the accounts of the banks. Now he was talking about you know, this specific uh, Fed intervention, but what he said is true. This is the way the government really spends. And I'll explain why when the treasury spends, it is still a central bank keystroke because the central bank makes all payments for the treasury. Or Alan Greenspan, uh, the previous chair before Bernanke was um, asked uh, about the US social security system. Lots of people are afraid that we have an aging society and social security will go bankrupt. And Greenspan said, no, that can't happen. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there's zero probability of default. We cannot be forced to default on any debts that are in dollars, including the promised social security payments. Okay, now he said print money. Okay, that's not true. That's not accurate. Bernanke was accurate. It's keystrokes. We will keystroke those credits into the retirement accounts of the elderly. We can't run out of money, okay? So the MMT view is precisely the opposite of the orthodox view. It's not tax then spend, it's spend then tax. You spend first, then you tax. You can't take out of the economy what you haven't already put in. Um, and taxes are paid by debiting bank reserves. Banks have to have the reserves before taxes can be paid. Where do reserves come from? They can only come from treasury spending, central bank purchases, or central bank lending. There is no other source of bank reserves. So taxes can't be paid until the reserves are put in. When you go to the, uh, a magician's show and the magician pulls the rabbit out of the hat, you pretend like you're surprised. Wow, magic. Okay. Now you know that the magician put the rabbit in the hat before he pulled it out. You can't pull rabbits out that you have not put in. Okay. The same is true of the reserves. You have to put the reserve rabbits into the hat before you can pull the reserve rabbits out of the hat. Now, this is so surprising to most people. However, uh, I assume all of you have studied your principles of macroeconomics and you learned the injections leakages approach. You have to have the injections before you can get the leakages. The injections create income that can then be leaked out of the circular flow. Injections first, then leakages. What are the injections? Well, you always studied investment is an injection. Saving is a leakage. The investment has to come first before the saving can leak out. You have to create income through investment, then you can save. The same is true of government spending. That's an injection. Taxes are the leakage. You have to have the spending first before you can have the leakage into taxes. Now, the second one is not emphasized, probably in your class. It's emphasized in my class. Uh, but if the principle is the same. And so when we say you spend then tax, um, that is perfectly consistent with the Keynesian approach to macroeconomics. Uh, that is, uh, that still remain or lingers in the textbooks, including Mankiw's. Okay, um, so what MMT does, I said, is it provides a framework for analyzing national sovereign currencies. So we begin with um, uh, the money entries. Money entries are denominated in the national currency or money of account. Financial stocks and flows in, are also measured in terms of the money of account. We can think of the financial system as a huge electronic scoreboard, keeping track 
of the credits and debits in money terms. Charles Goodhart in 1996 wrote about three different versions of the paper. Uh, why is it that we, when we look around the world, the general rule, both today and historically as far back as we go, all the way back to Babylonian times, we observe each nation has its own currency. Why is it one nation, one currency? It's so ubiquitous, it can't be a coincidence. I'll come to his reason in a minute, okay? Uh, in the United States, our constitution actually says that only Congress can create money. And uh, sometimes uh, people bring this up and they say, hold it, it's unconstitutional for banks to be creating money because the constitution very clearly says only Congress can do this. Um, however, my own professor was Hyman Minsky and he used to always say, anyone can create money. There seems to be some kind of a conflict between these two things, but really there isn't. Only the national government can create the money, that is the money of account. Dollar in the US, pound in uh, Britain. And then we all can create money things or money records, records of nominal values. That is what we are recording in that financial system scoreboard. We're recording money records denominated in the state's money of account. So our, our uh, alternative approach to money is that it's a state monopoly in the sense that the state chooses the money of account. We then denominate transactions and financial assets and financial liabilities in that money of account. There's a hierarchy of IOUs. They're all liabilities. But as Minsky said, anyone can create money. The problem is to get it accepted. The government's IOUs, what we call currency or bonds, are the most acceptable IOUs in the economy. And uh, then lower in the pyramid, there are banks and lower still, there are non-financial corporations and lower still, there are small firms and also households. They can all issue debt denominated in the money of account. It's a money record. Uh, however, they have differing degrees of acceptability. When I first started uh, teaching in the early 80s, I would ask uh, my students, what backs up the US dollar? And the majority of students would say gold. Well, that wasn't true. Uh, we had gone off the gold standard in the early 70s uh, when uh, President Nixon left the Bretton Woods system. So it wasn't true even then. But what I would do is I would take, my, take out my wallet and I would take out a $1 bill and I would read to them what it says. It says, this note is legal tender for all debts public and private. Then I would take out a Canadian dollar. This note is legal tender, Australian dollar. This Australian note is legal tender, okay? And so we see a pattern, say, oh, okay. So what backs up the currency is that it's legal tender. Then I take out the UK pound. There's a picture of the queen. And the queen says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. This is written on a five pound note. What she says is if you bring her a five pound note, she will give you a five pound note or some sum of coins to total five pounds, okay? So it's not gold, it's not legal tender. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe not. So what people generally uh, describe this as is a fiat money that its value is determined by fiat. The government just tells you what it's worth, okay? Well, that would be a fairly flimsy thing to base your financial system on, is just the government's fiat. We, MMT, argues that there's more than that behind it, but it's not gold. 
Okay, but there is something standing behind it. We argue that it is the, uh, the value of money and the reason why currency is used is because of the power of the issuing authority. Okay, so money records are promises to redeem. They are promises to redeem debts. And when Goodhart posed this question, the way he answered it is that, you know, it's not a coincidence that we see one nation, one currency rule. The currency is tied up with sovereign power, political independence, and fiscal authority. So there's no wonder that when the Soviet Union broke apart, each new nation chose their own currency. They are expressing their political independence and their um, government is creating a fiscal authority. So what we focus on, what drives the currency is obligations that a sovereign authority can put on the population. For shorthand, we say taxes drive money. Today, the main obligation that the government puts on people is tax. But if we go back a couple hundred years ago, the main obligations were fees and fines, in some cases tribute, in some cases tithes. But it's an obligation uh, to pay that the government is able to put on the population. The government then issues a currency denominated in its money of account and accepts it back in payment of taxes. That is what we mean by the term redemption. The currency is redeemed when it is paid back to the issuer uh, to meet an obligation such as taxes. When taxes are paid, both the government and the taxpayer are redeemed. It's a simultaneous redemption. The taxpayer is redeemed because they don't owe a tax anymore. The government is redeemed because the currency uh, has been returned to the government. Uh, by the way, the, our English word revenue that we use for tax revenue means return to. What returns? The government's currency returns to the government. Um, and I know you, you always hear about this fabulous innovation, which was double entry bookkeeping, but monetary um, accounting is always quadruple entry bookkeeping. There are four entries that are wiped clean when you pay your tax, okay? You have an asset and a liability that are uh, wiped clean and the government has an asset and liability wiped clean. I wanna give one historical example. I could go on and on with, ex with historical examples, but this one is particularly clear. So Farley Grubb is uh, one of the authorities on American colonial currency. The American colonies were not allowed to issue coins. So the crown of England would not allow them to because the crown wanted the colonies to use the crown's old, own coins, okay? But there was a loophole. Nothing said that they couldn't issue paper money. Now, paper money had been issued in China for a long time, but this was, I think, the first big example of paper money being used in the West. So the colonial legislatures would pass a law that said, that permitted the uh, government to issue, let's say, 10,000 Virginia pounds worth of notes. At the same time, they would enact a new tax that imposed what they called a redemption tax, a redemption tax that was expected to raise about 10,000 pounds. People could use the paper money to pay their new tax. That created a demand for the paper money. And Adam Smith, the Wealth of Nations, mentions this in his book. He said, the strange thing is going on in the colonies. They're issuing paper money and it's accepted. And they don't get inflation as long as they don't issue too much, okay? So he noticed this. And it's very clear 
that these colonial governments knew what they were doing. They called it a redemption tax. The purpose of the tax was not to obtain tax revenue in order to spend. They knew they had to spend first, then tax. Nobody could pay the tax if they had not spent the notes. You spend first, then you tax. What do you do with your tax revenue? You burn it. You burn every note that is used to pay taxes. Tax revenue is not for spending. Tax revenue is for burning. Okay. Uh, now, there's nothing unusual about this. This was also true all over Europe. Most of the uh, sovereign governments in Europe spent by issuing tally sticks, wooden sticks. And when they received those back, there was a stock and a stub. When they received them back and matched them, they burned the tally sticks. Okay, what do you do with tax revenue? You don't spend it, you burn it. What do you do with coins? You melt them down and, it, and issue a new coinage. Okay, so taxes come after spending and you use the revenue for a fire. The way that it used to work was very simple and it was very obvious. And I'm telling you, the colonial governments understood it perfectly well. You spend first, spend your currency, collect it back in taxes, and then you burn it. Now, we don't do it this way anymore. Modern governments do not spend by printing up money, in spite of what Greenspan said. They don't spend that way, okay? They spend through their central bank, and their central bank spends through the private banks. So there are two degrees of separation between the sovereign and the subject. Two degrees of separation. That makes it so complicated, economists can't understand it. Okay. And so one of the things that MMT did was to investigate, to see, is this diagram still true? It's just behind this veil of two degrees of separation. And the answer is yes. It's just hidden behind a veil. So we peeled back the veil. Okay. And so for 25 years, we've been explaining how governments really spend, how they really spend. They do not spend tax revenue and they do not spend paper notes into existence. They use banks and central banks. So this is the way it actually works today. And uh, we've gone deeply into the details, okay? I, even though I'm peeling back the veil, I'm only peeling back a, a little ways, just enough to explain uh, in general terms how it's done. So when the treasury is authorized to spend, um, they can issue a check that is received by, let's say a contractor, okay? who's building a bridge for the government. The contractor takes it to the bank. The bank credits the contractor's deposit account. The bank sends the check on to the central bank. The central bank credits the bank's reserves. So how does the government spend now? The central bank credits reserves of private banks and private banks credit the deposit accounts of the contractors. Now today, most of this is just electronic. We don't even need the paper checks anymore. It's all electronic entries, okay? The key point is for every dollar or every pound that the treasury spends, bank reserves go up by $1 or one pound, okay? By identity, that's how they spend. What about paying taxes? Paying taxes just reverses the steps. The taxpayer writes a check to the uh, treasury. The treasury uh, sends it on to the central bank. The central bank debits the bank's reserves and the bank debits the deposit account of the taxpayer. And also uh, this is mostly electronic now. So most people pay their taxes electronically. So we don't even need the paper checks. It's just an electronic debit of bank reserves 
and electronic debit of the taxpayer's demand deposits. So let me summarize. Spending always leads to a credit to bank reserves and a credit to a deposit account. Taxing always reduces bank reserves and reduces the taxpayer's demand deposit. If spending is greater than taxing, that means reserves are net credited because more reserves are added than taken away. So that is how, uh, that is the uh, accounting consequence of a budget deficit. It's a reduction of bank reserves. Uh, sorry, an increase of bank reserve. A government surplus is a reduction of bank reserves. Okay. So what does the central bank do? The central bank facilitates payments by and to the state. Payments by the state efflux money, that is, gets it into the economy. Taxes reflux money. Uh, they don't finance government spending, they're used for redemption. Okay, so they reduce uh, the accounts of the taxpayers and the reserves of the um, uh, banks. Bonds don't really finance the deficit. If a deficit has occurred, if government spending has been greater than taxes, the, uh, it has already been paid for by the credits to bank reserves and to the accounts of the recipients of the government spending. The deficit has already been paid for before the bonds are ever sold. The deficit is ex post. It's after the reflux of taxes. And you, you, over the course of the year, when you're spending and taxing, you don't even know if at the end of the year, you're gonna record a budget surplus, budget deficit, or a balanced budget. You won't know till the end of the year. And usually it takes several revisions of the data before you really know whether there was a deficit at all. What that means is, that as you're spending over the course of the year, you don't know if you're gonna end up with a deficit, which also means there's no such thing as deficit spending. All spending is the same. At the time that it occurs, you don't even know whether you're gonna have a budget deficit or a budget surplus or a balanced budget. You cannot know until the end of the accounting period, usually a year. Bond issues then are not to finance deficits. They're actually functionally a part of monetary policy. They're not a borrowing operation. Sovereign governments actually don't borrow their own currency, which would be a nonsensical operation anyway. A sovereign government never needs to borrow its own currency. It issues bonds for a different purpose. It issues bonds as part of monetary policy to help the central bank hit its interest rate targets. And we see how nonsensical it is to issue bonds uh, for the, all the way since the global financial crisis because central banks have been engaged in QE. What is QE? It just means so you put some bonds into the economy and then you took them right back out and the central bank is holding them. So the government is owing itself. There was never a need to issue those bonds in the first place. Okay. Um, and so this it is starting to be recognized um, that uh, selling bonds is not necessary at all, whether you have a deficit or not, because sovereign governments don't borrow. Uh, the danger is excess spending, not excess money. Government spending takes one form only. There's no such thing as a choice. Let's see, should I use tax revenue? Or should I borrow? Or should I print money? There is no such choice. There's only one way you spend. I already described it. So Congress or Parliament authorizes the spending. Treasury cuts the checks. The central bank clears them by crediting reserves. The budgetary outcome is known only ex post. Okay. As Stephanie Kelton, my former student and colleague, uh, always says, <clears throat> cash registers do not discriminate. 
cash register doesn't care if you came from the government or you came from the private sector. Too much spending, government or private, can cause inflation. Keynes said, true inflation only occurs beyond full employment. Okay, if you're beyond full employment, you get what, you, what he called true inflation. Before full employment, you can have prices rising, but he called that semi-inflation, not true inflation. It occurs because of bottlenecks or perhaps pricing power. Could be labor unions, could be monopolists that have pricing power. And he, he argued against using austerity. Uh, it's doubtful whether austerity ought to be used if the inflation is coming from bottlenecks or pricing power. And just as one example, uh, back in the early 70s, 1974, OPEC quadrupled the price of oil. Okay, it's pricing power. The United States chose to implement austerity to fight the rising prices induced by rising oil prices. And we've suffered ever since. We never really recovered from that. Uh, Japan chose instead to become energy efficient to reduce their oil use per unit of output. Now, which one of those two strategies makes the most sense? Obviously, austerity made no sense. Becoming energy efficient was the right response to an increase of oil prices. Okay, MMT is not a proposal to ramp up deficit spending. Uh, people say, see, look at Japan. Japan is a good example of MMT because they have huge deficits. Well, that's not an MMT proposal. We follow uh, Ava Lerner's functional finance approach. Um, budgeting should be functional to pursue full employment, moderate inflation, sustainable growth, greater equality, environmental sustainability. All of those are in the public interest and the budget ought to be pursuing that. The budgetary outcome, outcome in any case is ex post, not discretionary. Japan has run high deficits and debt, not because it's following MMT. It's doing the opposite of MMT policy recommendations, as I'll explain in a second. But still, Japan does uh, validate the core MMT arguments about sovereign de deficits and debt. Deficits do not lead to inflation. Japan's problem has been deflation uh, for a whole generation. Bond markets cannot force default. In fact, the bond markets want more Japanese debt, not less. Bond yields depend on central bank policy. So Japan has had near zero interest rates for a whole generation because that's the central bank policy. So it doesn't depend on the amount of debt. What Japan has been doing is following a stop-go stop policy. So this is why we say it's not MMT. Since the collapse of the real estate bubble, Japan has been in and out of recession with sluggish average growth. In recession, they usually have some kind of a fiscal stimulus, but as soon as the recovery begins, they take out the stimulus and they usually enact some kind of a tax increase, especially on consumption, because they want to reduce uh, the deficit and retire some of the debt. So that is not MMT. This pushes the economy back into recession and the deficit climbs. So this is the usual way that you get big deficits. And I call it the ugly way you get deficits. You get deficits because growth falls. And so I came up with um, a simple graph uh, to show that there are always at least two ways to get a big deficit. The first is the ugly way. If you're at point A, you're, you've got some moderate growth, um, but the economy slows down, then you will produce a deficit as you go into recession and you can move to point B. That's the ugly way. The uh, pretty way to get a deficit is you've got some moderate growth and you would like to grow faster. Maybe you want to implement a Green New Deal. So you start spending more. You can move up to point C. But point C is a higher deficit with a higher growth rate. That growth rate is going to reduce the deficit because tax revenue will grow fast. And so you'll move to a point, something like point D. So the point is that 
just because you have a high deficit does not mean that you're using fiscal stimulus. You can get a high deficit because tax revenue collapses. Uh, de deficits are ex post, not discretionary. Another way you can get at the same thing that I've been describing is by using Win Godley's sectoral balance approach. So as Win uh, shows uh, by identity at the aggregate level, the sum of surpluses equals the sum of deficits. Uh, since income equals expenditure at the aggregate level, national income equals national spending. For one sector to run a surplus, at least one other sector must run a deficit. So we can uh, break up the sectors any way we want. We could have households, government, corporations, and rest of world. Uh, that would be four sectors. The one we usually use is three sectors the government sector, domestic private sector, which is households and firms together, and the foreign sector. A country like the US or the UK that um, runs current account deficits most of the time, um, typically will have a government deficit, a domestic private sector surplus, and foreigners are also running surpluses against the country. The only way to reduce the government's deficit is if one or both of the other sectors adjust their balances. So either the domestic sector has to reduce its private surplus, which is not a good idea, that leads to Minsky type financial instability, or you have to get the rest of the world to adjust their balance against you, which is difficult. You don't have uh, control over the economies of the rest of the world. So uh, the point is anyone who tells you that the government ought to reduce its deficit, they have to explain to you how they're gonna get the domestic private sector or the foreign sectors to adjust their balances to allow that to occur. It is not a simple result of discretionary policy. Okay, let me uh, finish by talking a bit about the crises we face. The world faces unprecedented and immediate challenges. Human survival is threatened. This is probably the greatest uh, threat that humans have ever faced. It will take coordinated and concerted effort by the richest nations. Why? Because they're the source of most production and they will, they have been and will remain the source of most pollution. So it's up to the rich developed countries to take this on. The age of austerity has to end. Uh, we can learn from the experience of war. How do you tackle a crisis? Well, we learned a lot from World War II. In World War II, the government absorbed 50% of GDP in the case of the US, probably more in the case of the UK. So we moved half of all the production to the war effort, okay? we're gonna to have to move more resources to our effort to fight these pandemics. How do we do it? Keynes explained how in a little book, 1940, how to pay for the war. He set out the plan. How are you gonna move the resources to the government without causing massive inflation? Because in every other big war, both the US and the UK had high inflation. We both had, well, World War I was not a big war for us. It was a big war for you. You had high inflation in World War I. We had high inflation in the Civil War. How can we prevent that? Keynes said the problem is when you go into a big war, of course, you're going to be beyond full employment of resources, beyond full employment. And the government spending is going to create income for everybody. Everybody's going to be working even more hours than they want to work. You're going to be paying them wages but there's hardly anything for them to buy because you move the production to the war effort. How can you prevent inflation? So he said, finding the money is not the problem. Preventing inflation is the problem. So he recommended three principles. Use deferred compensation to reward workers. Don't pay them now, promise to pay them later. Second, tax higher income people, not because you need tax revenue. Government doesn't spend tax revenue you need to reduce their consumption, okay? They don't need to consume a lot. They're already rich. 
And third, maintain adequate minimum standards for those with lower income. Uh, JFAG Foster said similar thing. He's an American institutionalist. I just want to focus on the first thing. Uh, whatever is technically feasible is financially possible. If we know how to do it and we can find the resources, we can always afford it, okay? Tackling multiple pandemics comes down to mobilizing the unemployed resources, shifting those that are already employed and creating new ones. How do we shift them? Through taxes, postponed consumption, maybe patriotic saving, rationing, regulations. We did all of that in World War II. Spending then allocates the resources as desired to achieve the public purpose. And the good news is taking on these pandemics, including a broad ranging Green New Deal is not gonna take anything like 50% of our nation's resources. Our estimate of the Green New Deal is the net increase in demand for resources for a broad-based Green New Deal is only 5% of GDP. So it's a small demand on resources. Okay, conclusion, no change of procedures is required to implement uh, our pandemic response. The central bank and treasury already know how to finance it. The ultimate constraint is resources, not finance. The budgetary outcome is neither discretionary, you can't control it, nor is it something to worry about. Interest rates are de determined by central bank policy, not by markets. Inflation can be avoided by policy focused on mobilizing resources and releasing them as necessary, as Keynes explained. So let me stop sharing and take questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the talk, Professor. It was really interesting. Uh, just to remind our viewers how to ask questions, you have the link under which you can submit your question on our um, uh, on our um, Facebook event and also in the comments under this stream that's going on now. Um, and my first question is about what is different about MNT ideal response to the pandemic compared to what mainstream uh, like economics idea would be about what we should do. So many people would say that even before pandemics, in the reality of uh, low interest rates and low inflation, there, there was a new emerging consensus in, in the mainstream economics that monetary policy is not enough. And we also need fiscal policy to step in to control inflation. And now, um, during pandemics, it seems like not only Keynesian, but even like mainstream economics are, uh, economists are advocating for huge fiscal spending. So my question is, why do we need MMT to have a best response to the pandemic? What is there uniquely about MMT po uh, po uh, policy recommendation uh, about how to respond to, to the pandemic that's different to what other economists would say? Yeah, well, yeah. so the, the big difference is that they believe you need very special circumstances in which you can expand uh, fiscal policy without worrying about inflation and without worrying about interest rate effects. So the special circumstances were that inflation has been low for quite a while and interest rates have been near zero. So it's pretty easy to have the growth rate above the interest rate, okay? We say you don't need any of those conditions, okay? The government cannot run out of money. Even if the interest rate uh, were high or above the growth rate, uh, we can still afford to do this. But let me tell you, already Larry Summers and Blanchard have started worrying about inflation. I, I, in fall of 2019, you're right, fall of 2019, I sat side by side with Blanchard. We gave testimony to the US Congress. We, we had identical um, views on uh, our ability to expand spending to do the Green New Deal. He agreed completely. Uh, don't worry, he said, because the interest rate is uh, very low and probably going to be below the growth rate, okay? But he came out uh, last week 
along with Larry Summers, they're both warning about inflation. Oh no, don't go too big. They're saying that Biden's plan is too big and it's going to be inflationary. Okay, so they are already backing off. That's the problem. Okay, uh, so if you you come at it from uh, an orthodox, uh, basically view, um, even though both of them are you know Keynesian orthodox, they're they're not monetarist orthodox. Uh, you're you're going to take your foot off the pedal too early which is what we did in the global financial crisis too. And Larry Summers was behind that. Larry Summers was one of the people that kept Obama's stimulus down to 800 billion. We should have had four times more stimulus. But all this worry about the debt and inflation forced them to keep the stimulus so small that we did not fully recover till 2018 more than 10 years, okay, uh, from the time the crisis first hit. So that's the problem. And during that whole period, Larry Summers saying, well, oh, we have secular stagnation. Well, yes, we do, because we have austerity. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question is about inflation. So a lot of criticism to MMT relates to this prediction that a monetary financing of deficit would result in the inflation. I believe that you termed this position inflation warriors. Uh, so the solution that MMT has to prevent inflation is, uh, is that governments can cut back on deficit spending or uh, by raising taxes. And the potential worry about this solution is that in practice, politicians who make decisions about fiscal policy act, act more in the response to what the general public wants, but not necessarily what, what is uh, like best for the economy at, at the moment. So the argument can be, for instance, that government is unlikely to raise taxes during a period of high inflation where uh, when public is already upset about rising prices. So what would you say to an like inflation warrior that, that, that would argue that independent central bank does a better job of controlling inflation than politics? Oh boy, okay. The, the, let me uh, save the independent central bank because this is a myth anyway. So that, that's a whole topic by itself, a very good topic uh, to discuss. Okay, first, there is no alternative to money financing of spending whether it's by the government or by households, it's always money financed. <laughs> that, that's how you spend, okay? The government spending is always money financed. There is no choice, okay? There is no special kind of spending, uh, as I was saying. So it's always money financed. All government spending always requires a credit by the central bank to bank reserves. That's how the spending occurs. This yeah, isn't I, a choice. I think that MMT would like to have more of um, like mo monetary finances of government spending than mainstream economics. No. Nope. Uh, all we're doing is describing. This is not a policy proposal. We say that is how government spends. It has no other option. It spends. You mentioned like that you disagree with people who would like to see a smaller response to um, to, to like ongoing pandemics because these people are more afraid about inflation than you are, right? Uh, well, I'm sure there are people who are more afraid of inflation than I am, yes. Um, uh, I just said, so uh, Blanchard and Summers are starting to warn about it. Now, I'll, I'll tell you their view, even for uh, mainstream economists, including, say, the people at the Fed right now, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're outliers. Our Fed is not worried about inflation, okay? Powell has come out and, and uh, said they don't see any danger of inflation. Now, we're going to get some price increases uh, through the economy because we are hitting a lot of bottlenecks, okay? There are bottlenecks in shipping, there are bottlenecks in uh, the global supply chains because of COVID. And so we're going to see some prices increasing, but as the factories reopen, as uh, shipping resumes, uh, 
these are going to be temporary. So I won't be surprised to see some uh, little glitches in the CPI going up because some items will go up in price. But we're, we're not going to get a sustained inflation. This is the view of our Fed right now, too. So I don't think that uh, MMT is an outlier on this. I think the, the, um, uh, the dominant view right now, even among fairly mainstream people, uh, in America at least, is that we're not likely to get much inflation from these packages. Let me also say, although we're calling it a Biden stimulus package, it's not a stimulus, it's relief. If you look at the items in the 1.9 trillion, this is mostly just relief. It, it is not providing income that it's gonna boost consumption. You're, uh, you're relieving state and local governments and school districts that have lost a tremendous amount of revenue uh, tax revenue has fallen through the floor. And so a lot of it is just relief. Um, so anyway, I, I don't believe that story. Um, the idea that uh, democracy does not work. Uh, and so we need committees of experts because we can't trust elected uh, representatives because uh, they are catering to the interests of the people who, of the voters who elected them is just anti-democratic. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, you know, we, we need what is best for the economy, not what is best for people. I think that is crazy. That's uh, uh, elitist, anti-democratic. Um, I don't share that view at all. Um, I think that we should be focused on what is best for people, not what is best for this abstraction, which is the economy. Something you cannot uh, feel, touch, hear. It's an abstract. It's a complete abstraction. Um, I don't. I don't want what's best for the economy. I want what's best for people. I want jobs. I want healthcare. I want vaccinations. Uh, it, I want food, energy, uh, and a clean environment. That's what we should be focused on. And that's what politicians should be focused on. Not some uh, abstract thing that we call the economy. Okay, independent central banks. Sorry, I, I, I'm sure you have other questions, but central banks are not independent. They are creatures of the government. They're created by the government. Um, the, the Fed, it's always said, it is a creature of Congress. And the, the heads of the Fed, when they go to Congress, uh, Bernanke told Congress this several times, said, look, if you don't know what, if you don't like what we're doing, tell us to do something different, okay? We're a creature of Congress. We will do what you say. Now, when, when people say that, there are two senses in which they, they say that the central bank is independent. One of them, uh, is, is true, although it's not a necessity. And that is usually we let the central bank set the overnight interest rate target. Okay, that is true. In the US, our Fed is independent to do that most of the time. In, in major wars, sometimes we take that away from them. World War II, we took it away. We said, no, uh, the uh, executive branch is going to set the interest rate, not the central bank. Then we gave them back their independence at the end of the war. Um, now people say then that's a good thing because they can use the interest rate to fight inflation. So they can be the warriors, the inflation warriors and the inflation fighters. Well, unfortunately, control over the interest rate is not a tool that gives you control over the inflation rate. Okay, it just does not do it. And uh, I've been saying that from, basically the day I started economics. Um, and I, the past 20 years has demonstrated that central banks cannot increase the inflation rate. They've done everything they could think of to try to increase the inflation rate. They've all failed. Now, before that, they'll say, well, that's true, but back we fought the inflation in the 80s and 90s and we got rid of it. I think that's also false. They didn't get rid of inflation. Uh, basically, 
India and China got rid of inflation for us by bringing so many new low paid workers into the global economy. Uh, they depressed wages in the West and they reduced inflation. It wasn't central banks. Um, the final way in which central banks are supposed to be independent is they're supposed to be the counter to the Congress or parliament. So supposedly Congress and parliament, you know, they're, they're always catering to the people who elected them. And so they're spending on all sorts of goodies for the population and they don't worry about inflation and that's what causes inflation. And the good thing is that an independent central bank can stop them from doing it. How do they stop them? Well, then you wonder, how do they stop them? Central banks cannot say no, okay? Congress gives the treasury the authorization to spend. Can the Fed take that away from the treasury? The answer is no. Will the Fed ever bounce a treasury check? No. Will the Bank of England bounce treasury checks? No, they're not gonna bounce a check. If you start bouncing the treasury's check, you're gonna lose faith in the payment system. If treasury checks can bounce, why would you trust any other kind of check? So it's simply false. Central banks cannot say no. Now they might raise the interest rate. If the, if the uh, uh, budgetary outcome is a deficit, okay? The only thing they can do is raise the interest rate. They can't stop the treasury from spending. And by raising the interest rate, they're gonna increase treasury spending because spending on interest will go up. <laughs> So by trying to, st trying to stop the treasury from spending, they're gonna in increase treasury spending. There's nothing they can do. Okay. Okay, thank you. So my last question is about developing countries. So this is like people very often criticize MM MMT talking about that, that it's easy for countries like the US not to care about their debt when it's like so easy to roll their debt because their, their currency is dollar but they say that it would be more difficult for, for developing countries. So I wanted to ask you, would you say that there are any differences in recommendations uh, about how to respond to the pandemic for the US and for the developing countries? Or do you think that basically uh, as long as developing countries issue their own money, it doesn't matter um, and there's like no difference whatsoever and, and they can follow exactly the same policies that the US can follow? Okay, now look, developing countries vary a lot because some of them peg to the dollar or to another international reserve currency. That means they are severely constrained in their ability to spend because they are liable to exchange their currency for US dollars. They can be forced into bankruptcy, okay? I mean, there's no bankruptcy procedure, but they can default on their debts. That happens. My question is about countries that have their own money. Do you think about okay. It? So I want to make that clear. So the ones that uh, uh, peg or that issue debt in foreign currency. So there are countries that have their own currency, but they issue government debt in US dollars. They're also very constrained. So as long as they don't peg and um, don't issue debt in foreign currency, they are able to use their currency to mobilize their domestic resources, just as you are and we are, okay? Now, their problem is that they probably don't have the resources they need to deal with the pandemic domestically. They're, uh, they're not necessarily able to mobilize foreign resources with their own currency they face a constraint. Can the US mobilize foreign resources with US dollars? Yes, it can. Can Britain? Yes, it can, okay? So we're not claiming developing countries can do exactly the same thing as the US. Domestically, they can. If they have unemployed resources, they're able to uh, uh, create a uh, vac vaccine and produce uh, the vaccine then they, they could uh, deal with the pandemic. But of course, I'm not describing reality for most developing countries. They cannot do it. They have to rely on imports 
and um, their ability to import will depend on their the demand for their currency abroad, which could be very limited. Okay, I think that's, uh, thank you very much for everything. I think that's all we had time for today. Um, and so thanks again for, thanks again for joining us, Professor Wright. Um, and have a lovely evening. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.